Well, hello friends. Welcome back to the program. Today we are going to keep working on our little JavaScript engine. And uh, I'd like to take a look at the Octane benchmark again, because we put so much time and effort into Kraken. And that Kraken is honestly getting pretty good. Um, if we run it, actually, if we run it with the JIT enabled, we can see that um, Actually, it's a little bit slower than usual on my machine right now, probably because I am recording video at the same time. But um, we have gotten pretty good at Kraken. And um, at least if I'm not recording and I have a build with LTO and everything, then it runs in about 11 seconds total, the Kraken benchmark, which is great because it used to take minutes in the past. So um, we've done a very good job at getting this thing to go pretty fast. Um, Octane still needs a lot of love. So, um, but shout outs to everybody who's been helping get Kraken to where it is. We still have, I think we can still get better on these, um, the handful of ones that are more than two, three seconds. Um, it would be nice to, to bring those. So we have everything, uh, neatly under one second. That would be great. But even where we are right now, it is pretty good. Um, so, uh, and actually, it, this is normally a lot faster. It's supposed to be like 850 milliseconds. I don't know why my machine is so slow right now. Probably OBS and whatever else. But um, yeah, let's let's uh, talk about Kraken instead. So Kraken, it takes a while to run. So I, I actually ran it before starting the video. Um, I can compare it against itself here just so we can see. Um, so uh, we have a total of 295 seconds it takes to run Kraken, which is almost five minutes, um, <laughs> which is not great. And Zlib is still uh, the worst offender. It's almost two minutes to run Zlib. Um, we got almost a minute to run the TypeScript subtest, and then we got uh, a couple of half minute fellas here. But uh, Zlib is the is the worst one by far. So we already looked at Zlib in one video, and um, I think that's when we ended up doing the vi variable access optimization. But I thought, you know what, we have to do more. We have to do Zlib again and um, improve the situation further. So let's just um, profile it and see what's going on now that we, well, now that we are where we are <laughs> and uh, pick the next thing to to uh, improve and grind down. And over time, I would like to believe that um, we should be able to, we should definitely be able to get both Kraken and Octane to run um, in less than a minute total. I think that will be sort of a great target to aim at at the moment. Um, and obviously, since since Kraken is already, um, you know, in 15 seconds or, or less range, uh, Octane is the area where we need to improve. And uh, there are different things going on in the different tests. So uh, it's good that so many people have been pitching in and sort of looking at the different tests and finding opportunities for optimization. Um, I'm just going to pick the biggest one because that's where you can <laughs> earn the most by uh, fixing things. So let's see where we're at in terms of event count. And I'm going to use this dash B here to get a backtrace. We can see that we are in new function environment, so doing a function call. And then we apparently get a random number when you allocate a block. Hmm. Why do we do that? I didn't realize that we do that. I wonder why we do that. Uh, how do I get there? Allocate block. Random index. To reduce predictability, take a random block from the cache. Oh, that's neat. Oh, I did that. Okay. <laughs> that's 
kind of funny. Um, sure. Oh, it uses unstable take. That is um, an API that we have on Vector. It doesn't get a lot of use, but it's a neat trick where um, you can take an element anywhere in the vector without um, without like causing it the subsequent element to shift around in the vector, if that makes sense. And you do that by first swapping the thing you're going to take with the last element, and then you take the last element. Um, so it um, might ruin your sort order. So that's why we call it unstable take, because it's not stable. It, it um, breaks ordering. But if you don't care about ordering, then it's a very neat trick to take something from a vector without um, without having to shift everything in memory. OK, uh, now that I chatted a bit, we can stop. And we got almost 39 billion events. So that should be good. And let's take a look. So what do we have? We have put by value. Sure. I don't remember how the last Zlib video ended. I feel like I probably like did a new profile and then looked at this and said something like, "Oh, typed arrays. Yeah, that's gonna we're gonna have to optimize typed arrays." So I guess that we are here, and now we have to do something about typed arrays. Hmm. Cool. So get by value heavy as well. We got put by value at twenty eight percent get by value 25%, both of them doing a bunch of typed array access, right, and then typed array things everywhere. Canonical numeric index string is a typed array thing. Yeah. All right, so it feels like this is essentially like a typed array stress test at the moment. Do we have anything else going on? Put, get, Two Boolean. Uh, yeah, but that's so little. Got bitwise and. Oh, surprised that that one ends up in C++. Would have thought we could do that in machine code, bitwise or. But let's not sweat it too much. Uh, we clearly have to do something about put by value for typed arrays. So uh cool put by value so we already have this fast path now we're looking at the sort of the common implementation in c++ uh, we already have a fast path and where um, you'd access like a normal javascript array if you have an object um, as the base of the access and then your property key is known to be in 32-bit integer which is positive or zero. And then we have a few more conditions here uh, where we need to know the shape of the underlying array storage. And we need to know the object isn't one that would interfere with index property access, which some objects do, um, but not the common array type. And we also need to know that the storage has that index. Right, so if you try to put um, put a value at an index that isn't part of the storage already, then we don't take the fast path. I think because then if it's not part of your storage already, then you would have to like honor, um, if there's somebody in your prototype chain that has that index as a property name, and maybe it's not writable and you have to look at all that stuff. So that's why we exclude that from the fast path. But this does not apply to typed arrays. So, and this, by the way, this fast path, we've also sort of translated to machine code for the JIT. Uh, so the JIT knows how to do this fast path without ever calling out to C++, which is really cool. Um, now, I think we should be able to do a similar fast path for typed arrays. It just has to work slightly differently because uh, typed arrays have their own way of dealing with storage, like they use an array buffer. And um, I don't remember exactly how it's put together, but <laughs> we'll, we'll discover it along the way. Um, 
so let's just say like if base is a typed array no base is object and base as object is type array okay um oh actually maybe this can be yeah this whole condition here has to be true for typed arrays as well so maybe this here is our array like and um, normal or non non typed arrays and then our typed array case can come after here so for typed arrays if object is typed array then uh okay thank you copilot but i think it's going to be a bit more complicated than that because typed array is a template class so we instantiate a whole bunch of those things how do we do that uh here right so declare typed array enumerate typed array right so we have all these different typed arrays and they're all implemented as uh, template instantiations of the typed array template class. And we can see here, the macro tells us like, what's the name of the class? Um, snake case version, I guess. Who's the prototype? Who's the constructor? And what is the underlying data type? And I feel like we should be able to fashion a fast path for all of these cases uh, I think a um, little bit if, iffy about the big int version for 64-bit values. Maybe um, maybe I ignore that one <laughs> for now. But um, but I think let's see. Well, let's verify that we're here in the first place. So put by value into typed array um, of type and then object. Yeah, just dump the class name. And then we can see come on, this is lib. Int oh, look at that. <laughs> it's a mix of all of them. Great. Or, well, not all of them, but like a bunch of different versions of the um, signed integer arrays. Okay, cool. So we need to handle at least all the signed integer versions. Um, so this typed array, is typed array tells us that it is what exactly? Typed array, it's a typed array base, is that it? Has to be it. No, typed array. Okay, so typed array base doesn't, typed array base inherits object, sure. But is typed array is in typed array itself. That's fine though, that doesn't matter. So, okay, so if we have a typed array, according to is typed array, we know that we have a typed array base which means that we can ask for um, array length, byte length, byte offset, blah, 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 content type. Content type? What is the content type? Big int or number? All right. What else we got? We got element size. Ooh, element size and element name. Interesting. So what do those tell us? Um, let's see, element size, element name. We about to discover information. Typed array base. 
that was not cool because you are hey why don't you like this oh because i need to include typed array sure so element size and element name Ah, so much spam. Okay, so element size is like the size of the thing that's inside of the array, sure. And name is just a class name again, sure. Um, but what I would really want to know is like the specific type of underlying storage, because in my fast path, I would need to do... Um, I need to do a property put, which would end up in like internal define own property or something like that. Internal define own property, right. So when you put a property into a typed array and that thing is, uh, let's see. So if we have a numeric index, Right, if you have an numeric index, then we do blah, 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 blah. Otherwise, we do ordinary property access. Right. But for numeric properties, and if you try to set any funky uh, property descriptor stuff like configurable, enumerable, we try to put an accessor on a typed array um, on property with a numeric index, then you just get told no. Of course, our put by value does not, uh, this is not um, the find own property. This is more like the find own property with default attributes. So we already know that it's not going to try to do anything funky like this. And it's not going to try to put an accessor um, either because at least, uh, oh, well. We have to make sure that this is a normal key value put. These would be accessors. Okay, sure. So let's see. Property kind. Key value and direct key value. I feel like we should only do the fast path in those cases anyway. I'm just gonna make sure here that we don't get in here in any funky um, situations where somebody's assigning an accessor. You can't be both, but you can be either. All right, so then Right, so it's rejecting all these different funky variants. And then if you just have a normal value field in your descriptor, which we have in put by value because put by value is just there to put a value somewhere. So we have a value for sure. So all of this stuff here, stuff we can assume in our fast path, then we want to call integer indexed element set with the typed array the numeric index and the value. So that seems very, very nice. And the template type name T here is, uh, what is the T? The T is the T of the typed array, right? Okay. So hypothetically, we should be able to do something like, um, integer indexed element set, uh, assuming that it's an 32-bit integer, right? Then we should be able to do like typed array followed by the index followed by the value. You don't like that because that's a has to be a canonical index. What do you need? Type index numeric or undefined uh, okay 
Who makes these things? Can I see? Um, bum, 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 bum. Okay, so canonical numeric index string is, I guess, the thing that would create one of these for you, right? It's called in all kinds of places. Good. Okay, so if the property key is a number, which in our case we know that it is, so then we want a canonical index type index. Cool, that's the one we want. So um, let's say canonical index is canonical index, um, not value, index, like that. Okay, and then, oh, it's um, might throw, sure. Try, right. And then we should be able to return at that point. Of course, this assumes I32, so we still need to know the type of the underlying storage. Uh, hmm. Okay, so the type of the underlying storage is, I don't think it's exposed, is it? Like in a, but we should be able to expose it. Um, what if I just say, element name um, and we will add a new thing called like the um, typed array we'll call it kind maybe because type feels weird here although type is kind of the right word um, let's call it kind We'll do that, and then we will make our little enum. And I guess the easiest thing to do is to just go to where typed arrays are enumerated. And we can just use this name, I guess, so the very first thing. Class name. Um, so this is the macro where these are made. Element name right here. So we can go ahead and like say virtual kind override return um, kind class name, something like that, right? Okay. And then here I need to um, I need to expand all of these guys. Something like that. Override was does not override any member functions. Oh, right. Can't be override when it's the first first occurrence of it. Okay, so now we have the kind of each one, which should allow us to switch on it here. So switch typed array uh, kind. And then like you and eight array. And then return integer indexed element set. Let's see. Yeah, I think this will work. Clamped array. They had a 
special type for that, like clamp T8. Yeah, makes sense. So that's like a um, saturating. So I think like clamped array means that you can't. Uh, I forget how that thing works, but it's something about like if you they can't go over two fifty five. Wait, what the hell does that thing do again? <laughs> I don't remember. What does that thing do? Um, clamp to zero to 255. Yeah, so you can't put values outside of that range. Okay, sure. Yeah, it's uh, somehow different from U8. I don't remember exactly what the detail is. I'm sure somebody in the comments can enlighten us. Um, but for now, let's just let Copilot fill these in. So very good. Float 32. Sure, 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 sure. Actually, Maybe I don't even need to do this either. I can just use the macro. Why am I not using the macro? Where's that macro? Let's use the macro. So our macro is like case class name colon followed by return this thing and this is the type. Okay. Hmm. Fascinating. I guess I can put it like that just for no, okay. <laughs> Clang format doesn't let me. Um That is pretty interesting. So, okay, he's unhappy. Verification false. Okay. In 32 array, I'm not getting to that case. What does this expand to then? Replacement. Wait, why doesn't that become anything? Yeah. Hmm. Oh. Right. I had um, one of those continuation slashes on the end. Uh, let's try that again. Symbol lookup error. Say what now? Uh, what? Two number. Oh. Oh, I guess I have to include the value in lines here. Okay, so now uh, the boogaloo. So are we doing it the cool way? I guess we might be. <laughs> um, let's see if we're taking the slow path ever. Slow path, sad face. Like the way <laughs> the way to see, uh, assuming that this is correct. Oh, we are on the slow path sometimes, although not often because it's not replacing. But yeah, so sometimes we end up on the slow path. That's fine though. 
But for typed arrays, we never have to go on the slow path. Yeah, so these are for non-typed arrays. Type, for typed arrays with these index, indexes, um, numeric indexes. That's cool. Um, let me just see that we, we didn't break tests. Okay, that's very positive. No test broke. So I guess the question is, how much faster is this? Um, so the old one was 115. And of course, I am recording, so it's going to be a little bit um, Also, I don't know if I have the JIT enabled. I do not. So let me make sure to have that. And then I'll run. But I think this should be this should be correct. And it's very, very nice that uh, typed arrays are spec'd in such a way that they just um, impose all these limitations on typed array contents so that you can't put like uh, accessors and unenumerable values and whatever in these numerically indexed uh, properties. And it's it's almost like they thought about engines wanting to optimize typed arrays when they added these restrictions. Um, so I think the thing about this that's a bit hairy, especially with our JIT architecture, is that there are so many different typed array types, and we don't know at runtime in our current architecture which kind of typed array we're dealing with. So if we wanted to um, have a fast path in machine code for these types of accesses, for typed array accesses, uh, it would be a whole lot of code everywhere. And it's almost like, almost like we would want um, a helper that we would emit once in machine code that um, that we could jump to whenever, um, if we encounter a typed array, then we could like jump to the helper that dispatches, that does the right thing based on the um, element size in the array. But okay, so what do we got? One minute 37. So previously we had um, <laughs> time math is not my favorite, but that is uh, 97 down from 115. So it's pretty good, pretty good improvement actually, just from that um, put by value fast path for typed arrays in C++. Like we didn't JIT anything. We just um, do a special case here for indexed, known numeric indexed access writing into a typed array. So I really like this, even just as it is, I think we should do it because it benefits um, the bytecode interpreter and um, we should figure out a jetting strategy as well. Although maybe I don't do that today. Um, instead, we can just do this. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So we'll just say like lib JS um, add bytecode fast path or add fast paths. Bytecode fast path. Common fast path for um, put by value um, into typed array for uh, when writing, when putting to a um, Merrick index property, um, we can skip a lot of the, skip a lot of the ceremony and go directly to into indexed element set. Yes, that is super nice, integer indexed element set. Then this thing is like doing a whole bunch of stuff that you could probably go, you could definitely go faster if you 
also don't have to do all this. Um, like for example, we we already looked at the typed array kind, so we know the content type is either big int or number based on the kind of array, right? So we don't have to do this branch. Um, we do have to convert the value. So you could imagine um, a version of this where like you've already checked that the value is um, either a big int or a number depending on what's expected. And then uh, you could have a streamlined version of this that doesn't need to convert, which means that you don't have to deal with exceptions actually. Uh, index validation, which looks at if the buffer is detached, and then, yeah, just validating the index, sure. And then an overflow check on the index, sure. And then poking into the underlying array buffer. It's a lot of verify assertions here. Uh, this looks like it could probably be <laughs> less um, less clunky. My goodness, this is some clunky looking code. This could definitely, definitely be done in a more streamlined way. It's very, very generically written, obviously, like you're creating an array of bytes to hold the, um, the number and then splatting that array of bytes um, into the underlying array storage, array buffer storage. Yeah, this is really, really clunky. So we could definitely make this better. But uh, we also had, uh, in that profile that we got, we also had get by value, right? So put by value was up here at 27. We had get by value at 25. So we should do that one as well. See if we can uh, crank it down further. So what did we have? 97 seconds, was it? I want to say 97. I already lost it. No, right here. Yeah, 97 seconds, 1 minute 37. So what if we also do get? Uh, I feel like that is like doing the exact same thing again, just um, fetching values. So um, let's see, what are you checking? Your property value. Property key value. Um, in this case, that has to be an object, sure. So we can do this. And then we can say like, hmm, non-typed arrays. Wait, how did I? For non-typed arrays, right, this is what I did. Okay, so for typed arrays, we want to do something slightly different. Uh, so if object is type array, we want to switch on the kind. Let's see. Like, let's see that we're just doing everything right here. So typed array base, we know that it's typed array base, and then we make the canonical index from the property key value. Sure, that makes sense. Um, maybe I will actually do that here. So auto index is because then I can use that here. And I can do that here as well. So it's just slightly nicer. And then put by value, I use the macro to do the thing. Just want to do the same thing. But now for each one, we're going to do integer element, integer into indexed element get. Uh, we don't need to provide a value when we get because it's returned to us. Is that it? Is that the whole thing? Hmm. Let's 
Let's see. It didn't break anything. Fascinating. So let's see if we got any faster. <laughs> um, but I imagine that this is going to give us almost the same speed up one more time, I guess, because both of them were roughly a quarter of time spent, like putting and getting. So this uh, Zlib test is very, very heavy user of typed arrays. And we are skipping past all the ceremony involved in the property access here and just going directly to um, the typed array specific, like integer indexed element get and set. And I mean, we're not, we're not going to be cutting out the whole cost of the access because of all that clunky code we're still running, but um, we're definitely skipping past a lot of the ceremony. And it'll be interesting to see how long it takes or how much time we're really saving here. Um, and I feel like we could definitely JIT this type of stuff, but I think we need to streamline the C++ code path a lot more so that we understand what what kind of machine code we need to write because the, the problem right now is that the the c plus plus is just very clunky and um it's a lot of checks and things okay one minute 25 that's even better so um saved what another 12 seconds so that's uh 60 plus 25 85 seconds that is not bad down from 115 when we started so 115 minus 85 is going to be 30 seconds. Half a minute shaved off. And we didn't even have to JIT. Uh, this is great, actually. OK, so that's really, really good. And what did I write in the previous one? Yeah, add common fast path for get by value from typed array. Uh, same exact idea as the previous commit, just for get by value. Um, yeah. This is really, really cool. So now I kind of want to get a new profile, actually, to see where the bottleneck is now. It's, I mean, it's probably going to be in in uh, put by value and get by value still but maybe something else sort of comes up to the top or like starts sneaking up and we can see what that is um, lately i really enjoy running call grind control dash b so you can get a, a backtrace of what's going on right now so maybe i could fashion myself something like interval one call the right control b um i don't know like head in 20 maybe look at that that's neat that's a nice way to monitor what it's doing actually okay so still hitting those get by value put by values of course, we're, now we know that we're just taking that fast path much of the time. But it looks like that's still what it's doing. Yeah. It's almost exactly what we expected to see. Um, so I guess let's, um, let's cut it off there, see what we're looking at. Okay, now get by value is at the top. Fine. And put by value is at 18%. So there's a little bit of a um, power shift, I guess. Put by value was on top previously, not get by value is on top. Although that might just be because I profiled slightly different um, segments of the of the run. But get by value. 
And uh, just looking for anything goofy that stands out. Two I-16. Oh, that's kind of sad. F mod. Hmm. Um. I think this could probably have like an if is in thirty two. Like that. I think that would work. Not sure though. I'm not gonna dig into that now, but I think you could do this for all of the like two I16, U16, uh, and so on. Um, to I8, yeah. There's a bunch of those. You should be able to do this because if you know that it's an N32, you don't need to go through the the whole process here of making it into a double and like doing modulo to figure it out. You can just do a little bit of. Uh, integer casting magic and C++ will have your back, I, I think, but <sighs> I'm not going to do that now. Maybe somebody will make a PR about it. Um, yeah, get my value. Just thinking, what are we looking at here? And like, how could we make a cool JIT fast path for this? So... Yeah, I think the steps here are clean up the C++ uh, things that happen in response to type three get by values. So integer index element get and the corresponding um, index element set. You need to like look at what those things actually do. Rip out all the unnecessary stuff. Uh, looks like that thing is calling to I16. Yeah, those things I think could be optimized for sure. The machine code fast path could probably take care of stuff like that. Um, feels like base object forget could be avoided or elided somehow. If you um, you can do a machine code check that you are calling that that um, that the base is an object. Then you can have a fast path for that where you don't have to do this. Although base object forget is like, it takes care of the case where you call um, functions on a primitive string, for example, then we have to pretend like you're calling it on an object, even though a primitive string is not an object. So we make sort of a, a synthetic temporary object that you're calling on. It's a little weird because um, we don't actually allocate anything. We just behave slightly differently if you call uh, functions on a primitive value. I think that's what that thing is for. Um, but yeah, there's definitely money on the table here. But I think maybe these two changes that we did are enough for uh, for video. So uh, let's let's end it here. But uh, I think this was nice progress. We knocked. 30 seconds off of the 115 second runtime, which means that um, what am I trying to calculate? Uh, we um, yeah, we chopped off a, a healthy chunk of the time, but there's still a lot of time left to to chomp down. And then there's all the other tests. I don't know which other ones use type arrays. I at least that some of the um, octane subtests use type arrays. So probably like um, Game Boy emulator subtest and uh, PDF JS subtest and probably some other ones. Um, yeah. Anyways, this is a nice progress and no JIT today, but still great progress. So if you made it to this part of the video, thank you so much for hanging out. And uh, 
for sticking it out with me while we continue to improve libjs and uh, i guess yeah the the goal that i mentioned earlier of uh, getting both kraken and octane to run in under a minute i think that's a that's a very realistic goal that's it's going to take a lot of work still but we can definitely get there and i think um i think it's really, really cool how so many people have been helping out with LibJS performance recently. Um, really, really thankful for that. And I hope that that will continue because it's just uh, it's a lot of fun to do these things together. It's um, um, so much performance work to do, and it's so much fun that I want other people to have the fun too. Um, that's um, in part why I try to leave little ideas and clues for, for things that you could do in these videos. Um, anyways, thanks for hanging out. I'll see you all next time.